So um, welcome everybody to uh, another Time Zero and Digital Yacht joint presentation. Uh, we're going to look primarily at the TZ iBo app, which is a really exciting navigation and charting app for uh, iPads and iPhones as well. But most importantly, how you can integrate it with some of the digital yacht hardware that's available to get your boat data via NMEA 2000, NMEA 183, or even AIS and GPS data into the iPad and tablet and utilize that on the TZ iBoat app. So the format of uh, today's webinar is we'll talk about the hardware first of all, and then my colleague uh, Daniel at Time Zero will run through some of the features live on the iPad, showing you some of its latest features. So uh, Nick, can I have the next slide? So I think first of all, it's important to talk about the two options that you've really got on board for navigation. In the past, everybody used a traditional multifunction display. Gradually, these have become more and more popular, obviously, a uh, variety of different screen sizes. They're rugged, they're tough. You can view them in any weather conditions, but they are vastly expensive. I just had a quick look at a 12 inch Raymarine Axiom display is just under $4,000. And and actually, the technology that's going into that display is relatively limited. The screen resolution isn't anything like that of a modern tablet or iPad. And also, in some ways, you're tied to expensive plug-in charts and also a constrained selection of, of charts as well. Uh, you're reliant on that manufacturer keeping that product up to date all the time. Uh, and actually, maybe it's not as intuitive to use as something like an iPad. So about 10 years ago, um, iPads became commonplace on board the boat. iPads have progressed enormously now. Uh, super high resolution, the latest Pro range feature, uh, 2732 by 2048 pixel resolution, so super 4K resolution on the screen. And of course, you can choose from hundreds of different apps, not just TZ iBoat, although that's one of our favorites, uh, but you're free to choose lots of other ones. So actually, for the sake of a few dollars, your uh, iPad becomes a sort of multifunction chart plotter with lots of different apps available. You can also use it at home for home planning. So when the boats are shore in the winter and things, you can plan your trips, have all that information there. Uh, and it's also multi-user. Um, the apps and uh, our devices support multiple connections. So you can have your iPhone and iPad or a crew member's iPad connected to the system. Our hardware actually supports up to seven connections on the boat. And then perhaps most importantly, iPads are obviously internet connected. They don't need to be internet connected when they're on board your boat, and we'll look at that. But it does mean that you can get updates whenever you take it back home or you're in an internet cafe or something like that. You can get charting updates, download the latest weather, and get that overlaid onto the iPad. And most importantly now, We've brought along hardware that allows you to connect to the boat systems. So NMEA used throughout the boat, wind, speed, depth, AIS, GPS, and so on, uh, can now be uh, transferred across from old and legacy instruments across to the, the iPad. And that's the key bit, really. One final caveat is that whilst the screens have got much better in sunlight and they're now waterproof in a lot of cases, they do get hot and will have limited screen viewability. So our suggestion really is some sort of hybrid solution where maybe you have a smaller, cheaper standalone MFD and use your iPad as the primary device down below up on deck as you need to uh, and take advantage of all those different apps. So Nick, let's uh, take a look at the hardware. Can you see the next slide? So one of the key things is that you don't really wanna be utilizing the GPS that's built into the iPad. It's not a great GPS. Uh, it also probably won't work below deck on a boat, especially if the boat's wood or steel. Uh, and it consumes an enormous amount of power from the iPad. Plus, you also need to have a, a more expensive iPad with the GPS built into it. So the real secret is to get a device to connect to your boat's instrument systems, GPS or even AIS, and get that data sent wirelessly across to the uh, mobile device that's connected. That same connection can be shared on phone, iPad, and so on. So that's what we call an NMEA to Wi-Fi server. Two different formats of NMEA, which we'll look at in just a sec, uh, but it basically allows you to connect to either of those two uh, network systems and get data sent across to the app that you're using. Now, if you've already got a Wi-Fi network on board the boat, many cruisers will probably have an internet-based Wi-Fi network. You can actually get these little black boxes to join that network 
and then have one Wi-Fi network on the boat with both your internet and NMEA data. So let's take a look at the servers. Nick, uh, next slide. So a uh, key thing basically is to look at what type of data you're working with on board the boat. Uh, older systems probably use legacy NMEA 0183. And more modern systems uh, that have probably been delivered in the last uh, five to seven years will use NMEA 2000, which is a, a network-based system where all the instruments plug into a backbone and then all the data is then available on that network. So we have actually three different types of NMEA to Wi-Fi server. The WLN range uh, is available as a WLN 10, which is a single input device and the WLN30, which is a three input device. We always recommend people go for the three input device because it will allow you to connect uh, three different sources of NMEA information. So you could have instruments, GPS, and AIS. And it also gives you an NMEA 0183 output, which is great for controlling an autopilot. So even if you've got an old legacy system, maybe one of the old Raymarine systems, old Furuno systems, old Garmin systems, all using 0183, you can still get that data into a modern iPad and transform your navigation system. Hey, hey Nick, you, question about that one. Sure. Do you allow for, um, do you have like an interface where you can kind of uh, do any management of that data? So the units can be set up in a variety of different modes. So when you first connect them up, you can log into the web interface that's built into them and you can set up the device as uh, a primary AIS gateway or instrument gateway. There's about 12 different operating modes. Um, so the user can set up the mode of operation that's needed and generally filter out the sentences that they don't want or what they do want. You can also configure how the data is sent back as well um, from the app and whether it's you're using wireless data coming back from the app as the output or whether it's just multiplexing the data that's there. So it's made for that's simple consumer installation with all the different possibilities of how to set it up built in there. There's even a developer mode, which again, you can you can have a look at where we encapsulate raw data and people can start doing their own things. But for time zero, really best just to leave it in gateway mode, instrument, GPS and AIS data will all come streaming across. So Navlink, uh, very similar device, looks the same. You just connect a T into the NMEA 2000 backbone. It's self-powered from the, from the backbone as well, so there's not even a power supply needed. Uh, connect to its password-protected interface, and you're good to go. And the setup on Maxi and Time Zero is super well-documented. It's a, it's a two-minute thing to get it up and running, and then all that data will stream across. Nick, can I look at the next slide? So the other key thing about using an iPad is to get AIS data. AIS has really transformed the way we, we use navigation. I reckon it's the biggest step change probably since uh, GPS was introduced 30, 40 years ago. AIS has made a huge difference to the way people navigate on board boats for anti-collision, identifying targets, looking around corners, which radar doesn't give the option to. And at Digital Yacht, we actually make two AIS transponders that have got wireless integrated specifically to get data Across. So if you haven't got an AIS in your system, you can actually use these devices as a wireless gateway to get the AIS and GPS data into the iPad. So if you have got AIS on board the boat, either a receiver or a transponder, you use one of our NMEA to Wi-Fi servers. And if you haven't got AIS, then we've got AIS transponders and receivers. So the entry level device is a product called IAIS TX. It's wireless only. It was designed specifically for people that just have a iPad or tablet on board the boat and want to use that for navigation. So there's no frills, super simple to install, connect power and the antennas, and you're good to go. At the other end of the scale, we have our AIT 5000, uh, which is a splitter integrated, so you can share the main VHF antenna on the boat for AIS and uh, VHF uh, transmissions. Uh, it also has wireless, of course, for iPads and tablets, and it's then got a plethora of different NMEA outputs for traditional electronics, NMEA 0183, NMEA 2000, USB, and so on. So, uh, you know, a device that fits into just about any type of system. So there are two popular wireless-enabled AIS transponders if you haven't already got uh, an AIS on board the boat. So, Nick, next slide. Then finally... Lots of people want to integrate radar, and TZ iBoat does this very nicely with their sister company, Furuno's 
product. It's called a DRS4W. It's a compact, I think, 18 or 20 inch radome. Uh, Furuno make legendary quality radars. The Furuno radar has got a wireless access point built in that our mobile devices can join. So that effectively, the Furuno becomes the the router on board the boat to uh, share the both instrument AIS data and also the radar data. And then Time Zero natively supports a radar overlay image. So you can have a combination of radar and charting up on your iPad. So it's a great addition, but only works with the Furuno radars. It's something that's uh, super good and literally turns your iPad into a full function radar. Uh, next slide. So a uh, big question is, what about if you want to have internet on board uh, as well as navigation data? Well, we've got a solution for that. Um, we have internet uh, connection devices based around 4G, 5G, L uh, LTE. <clears throat> and our 4G Extreme has got an NMEA 2000 interface built into it. So this allows you to get online through LTE connections up to about 25 miles offshore using a uh, MIMO based technology with dual external antennas and that's what gives you the range and the speed and then the box also features a NMEA 2000 interface so you can share the NMEA 2000 data together with the internet data and have one network on board the boat with everything there so your kids can be surfing the web whilst you're happily navigating with your TZ iBo application but also the TZ iBo application can use the internet connectivity to download charts uh, to up, upgrade or update charts and also to download weather information and most importantly share things like waypoints current location with other tz iboat users sending data into the tz iboat cloud which daniel will talk more about later that will also then integrate as well with with larger furuno systems so that waypoints and uh, created on the tz iboat app can be shared with other compatible devices so a very nice bit of integration if you're looking to have both internet and NMEA data up on the boat. Uh, next slide, Nick. So that's all I've got to say on the hardware front. Uh, Daniel's now going to take over uh, and just run through the actual app itself. Um, but if there's any questions, we can either leave it to the end, but if anybody's got any, any uh, pressing questions, uh, maybe just raise a hand and uh, my colleague Nick can unmute you and you can ask. If not, we'll just open it up at the end for everybody to have a chatter. I guess that's my cue, Nick. Um, yep. Well, thanks everybody for joining. Yeah, my name is Daniel. I'm the West Coast rep for uh, Noble Tech here in the States. And uh, so, yeah, I'll uh, share our screen with TZ iBoat. Just give me one second here. <clears throat> so I just want to uh, touch on a couple of the hardware points. Um, so for TZ iBoat, we use um, sort of exclusively NMEA 0183 data. So regardless of whether you're um, using an NMEA 2000 system or uh, an NMEA 0183 system. We're going to use uh, 0183 data, so it's um, it, it's important for the Navlink product to do that data translation for us. So that's one of the things they do. Um, and you know, if you have more complex um, NMEA 2000 systems, it's really important to either make sure that your system is instanced correctly, or that your installer, when they do that. Um, sort of deals with all the the device instancing so that we you know if there's multiple devices that maybe you've got a gps receiver and an ais transponder that we know which gps unit you're using things like that um so this is tz iboat so this is our ios application um it launched oh, what six seven years ago i guess and um We've made a lot of improvements over the uh, you know past number of years. Uh, we're working with the Fruno Wi-Fi radar. Certainly was one of them, um, and that's a really nice feature. <clears throat> um, the the one limitation, uh, or there's there's two limitations with the the Fruno Wi-Fi radar. One is it's an iOS device only, so you can either use it with uh, 
TCI boat or uh, they do make a standalone uh, application. Uh, if you want just a, a single um, sort of uh, radar display and they do uh, allow you to pair it with one of their smaller sort of entry level um, GPS plotters, the, I think it's the 1871 and the 1971, they're, they're a small um, sort of standalone plotter that'll connect to that, uh, that radar over Wi-Fi. So that's another, uh, another option. Um, to take advantage of the uh, digital yachts products, we've got a fairly simple user interface to go into that. So uh, the easiest way and what we recommend is to connect over uh, UDP. So this is a, a one-way connection. It's time zero, listening for the data that's coming out of the gateway. And the way you would do that is you would go in uh, to the settings, and then down to initial setup and it would say enable NMEA gateway here and then you go to gateway configuration and you'll put in the IP address of the digital yachts gateway which is UDP port 2000 and if I had one running live in my office um, you would start to see data flowing through there I don't have one so we're going to go back to the the, the <clears throat> simulator that I'm running but then you would start to see data flow and um, your targets would appear and your heading would appear and things like that. Um, one of the other uh, things that we added a couple of years ago is actually autopilot output. So if you have a standalone autopilot that'll take uh, you know, enemy data in, um, you can enable uh, pilot configuration. So in, the, the setup that's here now is pretty good and it works with most autopilots on the market. We've done a lot of testing on this, but if you have any issues, you know, read your autopilot manual for what sentences it wants to receive, and then you can set those all here. Uh, but like I said, the default out of the box works with Bruno and Garmin and uh, a lot of the Simrad or Navico pilots. So they, they all, uh, they all work pretty good. Um, the other nice thing is if you are on a, uh, small boat, and uh, I've worked with a lot of um, sort of offshore sailors and things like that. The same pilot information will show up on like a little four inch deck display. So even if you don't have an autopilot, but you want, you know, bearing to waypoint information or distance to waypoint information or ETA information, you can set up uh, TZI boat to output oh, the same pilot sentences. And those little four inch displays or deck displays of data repeaters will display that information. And so it's a really nice way to, um, to you know, if, if you're sailing to Hawaii and you wanna just throw the iPad down below, um, that'll give you something to steer by, which is really nice. Uh, the one limitation for, um, for uh, pilot configuration is that you need to run in what's called TCP mode. So this is bi-directional. So in addition to knowing the UDP port number, you also need to know the IP address of the gateway. So by default, um, and it's uh, listed on their documentation, but it's you know 192.168.1.1. So you put that in here where it says IP address and you put in the same port number. If you have it connected to another system, you just need to know what the IP address of that device is um, and, and uh, you know, know what the network configuration that you're connected to is. Um, and then off you go. And it, it works great. You know, last summer when we were testing out uh, our new TZ maps um, charts, I basically spent most of the summer uh, navigating on TZ iBoat, even though I, you know, had a full um, time zero professional system and an MFD. Uh, it was really quite simple. Um, a couple of the nice things, you know, if you're connecting to something that has internet access, so uh, we give you the ability to stream your charts. Um, you know, we always recommend that you download the charts ahead of time and cache them out on the device before you go. Uh, but we do allow for chart streaming. Uh, with TZI Boat, we also add in uh, a couple of other features, uh, Bathyvision, which is some really nice bathymetric charts, um, satellite photos. Then these are streaming sat photos, so they're pretty up to date. 
Um, you can turn depth shading on and off. And, you know, the power that's now available in TZI mode is, um, is pretty comparable to that of an MFD in terms of, you know, 2D view, 3D view, depth shading, fishing charts. Um, we also uh, now offer uh, a community maps. So this is uh, a way for you to um, make chart objects. So if you see that there's a buoy missing, um, you can go in, you know, similar to uh, what was done with Active Captain. But the advantage for us is that, you know, these are, you know, just chart objects. And um, let's see here. Doo, doo, doo. So we'll go create a new chart object. And there you can put in obstructions or beacons or buoys and things like that. Update marina activities. Uh, you know, if a buoy is off station, you can note that there as well. And if you have an internet connection, this will load up to our server and you'll actually be able to see everybody else's um, community edits. Uh, if you drive past a, uh, a community edit from another user, you'll be prompted to give it a rating similar to how Waze does it. Uh, you can use your iPhone or your iPad to take a picture of a shoal or a reef or a rock and that'll get uploaded as well. And then that additional information is available for everybody to, um, to see. Uh, another big feature, and I use this all the time, is our weather service. So um, it's free from within the application. You don't even need to buy charts to use it, although we do appreciate it if you do. Um, we do have a high resolution uh, weather service that allows you to pick a couple of different models. And this will change depending on what part of the world you're in. So in the US, we have the uh, Namclonus model and GFS. Uh, in Europe, we'll have Arom and Arpege and DWD. Uh, so it does definitely give you a lot of options for, um, you know, sort of a weather presentation right within TZI boat. And you can customize it. So if you want to see, you know, wind speed and barometric pressure offshore, you can do that as well. Uh, the other thing that we allow for is a, uh, if you have an internet connection, is going to be a thing called dynamic moorings. So this is really uh, a really interesting new feature. Uh, what this is going to do is take a look at your downloaded forecast and the topography of the area. And it'll show you spots that uh, will have um, good anchorages and based on the forecasted wind speed. So really, you know, being able to, you know, either have an internet connection on your device itself or, you know, tie into uh, the onboard wireless, uh, as Nick was saying, uh, really opens up a lot of um, new opportunities for, you know, uh, uh, new features in the software and uh, a lot of new safety features. Uh, and then lastly, we have a cloud service, as Nick mentioned. So uh, cloud.mytimezero.com. And, uh, you know, the, um, so I'll, I'll just go ahead and make a little new route here. And when I log into our cloud service, you'll see that uh, this guy has been synchronized, hopefully. Okay. And to do that, you just need to log in and uh, turn on cloud synchronization. If I stop my sharing here, switch over to our cloud server real quick. So um, yeah, with my uh, server kicks in, we'll be able to um, 
you know, see the routes and user objects that uh, we have here. It also works as a route planning tool. And uh, one of the other nice features is our uh, built-in anchor watch function. So this is, uh, you know, something that you can set up where, you know, if you, let's say, leave a device on the boat while the boat's anchored, uh, you can go in and, um, uh, you know, go ashore. If the boat starts dragging, you'll get a um, SMS warning from the onboard iPad or onboard iPhone if you have an extra one sent to either your mobile device or um, your email. So that's another uh, handy reason to have a uh, internet connection on board. So that's the uh, that's the quick run through it. Um, I guess we should open up to some questions and, and see what uh, people- Daniel, could, could I just ask what... one other thing? Obviously the- yeah. People were used before to having the original map media charts or the CMAP based mm -hmm. charting. With the new version, you've got the um, the new um, TZ charts. Can you just show us yes. the, the 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 availability of like vector charts and raster charts and the difference between them? Because I think that's a real big feature um, for for the app to be able to either view vector or raster type cartography. Yeah, let me uh, I'll bounce back over here. So yeah, in the past, uh, and we'll see if I, what I still have loaded, right? So I still have uh, some legacy charts um, and you can see that if you're, uh, if you've been with us for a while, you'll see that uh, MM3D, so map media 3D vector charts and map media 3D raster charts. Uh, you know, these were kind of a one shot every year kind of deal. Um, and, you know, we'd have to wait to update them the uh, new TZ maps, you know, you get three different chart options. So you get the uh, TZ vector charts. And what's really handy about this is they're really nice to customize. So, uh, so if I go into vector chart preset, you'll see that I can, you know, change the color palettes. So if you're down in the Bahamas, you know, uh, this is the color palette that the Explorer charts use. If you're in Europe, you know, we give you the French color palette shown um we give you the color palette for chs and we have a new cruise color palette as well and all of these are built into the the new chart so it allows you to you know, really customize um you know what you're looking at um depending on what you want to see for chart icons we can either do simplified icons or paper chart icons and so you can actually make our new vector charts look and feel a lot like a traditional raster chart um, you'll see the fonts very similar to a raster chart, and I'll switch over here um, just so we can take a look at the raster chart for that same area. Um, the big advantage of this is if you're operating, you know, in north up mode, it works fine. If you're operating in heads up mode, you know, the, um, the uh, you know, the numbers are going to stay printed because it's just a scanned image of that paper chart. But if we do the same thing, um, in TZ vector charts, you'll see that you know all the soundings. No matter what my chart orientation is, um, you know they will rotate with you on the screen. So it allows us a lot more um, control. And with the you know the sunsetting of raster charts, both the physical printed charts, but also the sort of imagery that's used to make them. You know this is a technology shift that we needed to do to be able to you know give that same uh, sort of user feel. Um, but it's really nice because, you know, if you want to see what the original raster chart said, as long as we still have access to that raster chart, you'll get that included as well. Um, and we've included that now as one price. So if you've got, um, you know, the the vector charts, you also get the raster charts and you get the bathymetry information as well at no additional charge. So you'll see, you know, in 3D, some really nice fishing charts with, you know, custom contour lines and things like that. Um, as a plug for our PC-based applications, you know, if you have uh, space for a computer on board uh, and either um, Time Zero Navigator or Time Zero Professional, uh, if you buy charts now for the, the larger um, platform products, you'll get the TZ maps on your iPhone or your iPad uh, at no additional charge. And that's another really nice feature that we've been able to do. 
since we now sort of control more of the chart production and licensing and things like that. Does that answer your question, Nick? Yeah, no, I, I was good. I think it's an it's uh it's kind of a hidden. You're not making enough noise about it because I think that's a really key uh key feature. The other the other one is uh, just on alarms. That there's a great uh, TCP and T uh, and and CPA alarm built into Time Zero, where you yeah. if you've got AIS connected, you can set the closest point of approach for a target, and perhaps more importantly, the time to closest point of approach as well. So you've got mm -hmm. some pretty advanced uh, alarming capability in there for anti-collision work and so on. Yeah, uh, and if you click on one of the AIS targets, we also give you a graphic CPA. So what this will do is it'll actually show you on the chart your projected course, their projected course, um, you know, where you're going to end up at the end of that CPA alarm, so six minutes from now. And then... Um, you know, what the uh, distance between uh, the boats is going to be. So if I switch to a different one, do the same deal, see what the projected CPA will be. So it's a really a great safety tool. Um, and then that uh, data bar on the left-hand side of the screen that we see there, which has got the course and speed and tide information for the uh, nearest port, that you can remove from the screen. Uh, you can also add data to it. <clears throat> so uh, Daniel just added depth. So again, that's data you coming from click on the... add. Yeah. So if, depending on what you have for um, sensors on the boat, you know, wind speed, heading, uh, depth, uh, and then you can also do some of your route information uh, as well. Um, although, you know, if you're uh, if you are uh, navigating, we also have a, a couple of other little features. So we have a trips tool. So if you hit navigate, um, it'll give you the option to um, start what we call a new trip. So this is kind of a logbook kind of thing. And there's also a button down there that says live. And what that'll do is it will um, let all your friends know that you're out for an adventure and they can follow along. So if we hit start, um, puts you into um, sort of a cruising mode by default. You can change this in the settings. And then it gives you some basic waypoint information. If I was following uh, a route, it would give me all the, you know, bearing to waypoint uh, stuff as well. So we'll just do a simple go to, and then you'll see at the top, um, uh, sort of a data bar that gives you some more route information. So if you're uh, navigating on an autopilot, this is what would be sent out to your autopilot. Very cool. Uh, yeah, so any questions from the group? You're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna need to unmute people, Daniel. Yeah. I will leave it to you because you're the host. Uh... <laughs> got it. Yeah. So if you got a question, feel free to just raise your hand or type it in chat. And... Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I'd be happy to. So, oh, let's go to one of my favorite spots. All right.
So I'm pretty fortunate to uh, live up near the San Juan Islands here in Washington State. And um, we've got what I think is some of the best cruising around. Other people might argue with me. But um, so here's uh, Sushos. This is a super popular state park. It's got tons of reefs and shoals and rocks and hiking and all sorts of good stuff. So uh, turn off that and go to satellite overlay. So one of the unique things is um, for satellite overlays, we don't show the um, uh, satellite overlay over the water. So what we do is we, and we've been doing this for, for a long time now, is we use what's called photo fusion. So we will um, display the satellite imagery down to essentially the zero mark on the chart or the low water, or low tide mark. And, um, and then we'll sort of uh, fuse that uh, down a little bit further. So you'll see satellite photos on sort of the shore side, and then you'll see um, where it's kind of blurred in with the inner tidal area, and then we just go to the chart. So we don't obstruct any of the chart objects that you would see in an anchorage um, with uh, uh, the satellite photo of just water. Um, <clears throat> here's actually, uh, a really good uh, example of our community edits feature. So this was uh, done uh, when I was up there uh, probably last year, I guess. And uh, you'll see that there's a bunch of little um, asterisks. So these are community added chart objects. And if you click on them, uh, give you some information and uh, you could rate and comment it. Um, and you know, what I did in this particular anchorage was I actually mapped the entire thing with, um, you know, had my radar overlay on and I was able to pinpoint exactly where all the buoys in the anchorage were. It's a pretty quiet day up there. And then went ahead and, and made some uh, additional notes on it. And here's another good example. So there's a little reef that sticks off of this point and, um, you know, so there's a good notation with the rock, but we wouldn't want to obscure that with the, uh, with the satellite photo there. So, um, <clears throat> so the Time Zero software uh, can uh, um, run alongside of Bruno MFD. Uh, we actually uh, do a lot of the software um, program for the MFDs out of France. So there's some similarities within the software uh, between either uh, TCI boat or Time Zero Navigator and the MFDs, but it needs to run on a standalone PC. <clears throat> um, oh, I see what you're saying there um, as far as the satellite photos. So um, we're actually streaming either from Bing or from Google Earth, depending on where we're um, where we are and who we're licensing from at the time. Uh, but one of the things that you can do Let's see here. Do, do, do. It's in one of these settings. Let's see. Just give me one second and I'll. So you can actually change the photo fusion transparency. <clears throat> so you can make the satellite photos more opaque. And then you can change where or how deep the uh, photo fusion goes. So uh, by default, we kind of stitch that into the uh, into the tide line there. But then you could you know essentially uh, go down to about 20 meters, 65 feet. Um, and uh, you know, show it so you can, you know, in areas where the maybe there isn't great um, great charting, um, you know, look at the satellite photos. Uh, one thing I will say, um, if you are in an area that's got some either inaccurate charts or uh, bad stuff, what I would do is certainly. Um, you can create a new chart object to let other users know that there's an issue, uh, but we now have a, uh, a new chart feedback function. This goes straight to our cartography team. Um, 
and uh, it's something that um, that they will take a look at. All right, so oh, da, 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 da. scroll back up here. Uh, so Nick, you've got one of the questions um, <clears throat> about uh, which which receiver would be good to uh, tie into a multiplexer. Okay, so if you've already got a multiplexer on board the boat, uh, then that should be compatible. Um, you'll need to set it up, <clears throat> obviously, for its relevant IP address and port number. What I'd probably do is we've got an AIS receiver called the AIS 100 Pro. So that outputs uh, regular AIS data at 38,400 baud, which is the standard speed, but it's also got an input on it as well. So that input could be tied to a, a GPS that's on board the boat because an AIS receiver won't have GPS data as standard. And the AIS 100 Pro would then multiplex that data, in other words, combine that data into one feed for the uh, existing multiplexer to send all the data out across to um, a uh, to, to, to the application. Having said that, the uh, you know receiver is good quality receiver is maybe three hundred dollars something like that. Now, you know you can get a transponder for maybe double that. And more and more people are opting now for a transponder than a receiver. It's obviously going to include GPS. You're sending your boat's position all the time and so on. So in some ways, uh, the investment in a transponder may well be the best thing to go for. But everything's doable. And if people have got you know, questions after this, they can just drop us an email to our, any of our uh, website contact form sales addresses and somebody will explain exactly what you need to do for your particular products that you've got. Uh, next one on the list, Mark. Uh, how can an operator tell the difference between a NOAA chart object and a community added chart object? That's a great question. So uh, first off, there is a layer that you can toggle on and off. Uh, so in chart overlay, one of the layers you can toggle is community maps. So if I turn that off, all of the uh, community edits, uh, regardless of whether you made them or somebody else made them, go away. And um, you can also tell that it's a community edit because of this little asterisk. So that's the, uh, that's the way that you can tell that that was added uh, by somebody other than uh, our cartography team. Uh, same thing with this. Uh, so this mooring was added, um, and this is a great example of it showing, you know, sort of what the forecast is going to do, and then, um, you know, sort of what direction the wind is expected to come from and when. Uh, Jose, yeah, um, I'm guessing the E next to the degrees is going to be either port or starboard. Uh, on my display, you can see that I've got P, so it's coming from the port side and what the apparent wind angle is. Um, I have to dig into my nautical Spanish to uh, remember what port and starboard are, but... Um, hopefully that answers your question. Any other questions? Well, I think we're all done then. So uh, thank you everybody for coming along. Uh, we'll drop you a mail with a, a link as well if you want to have a, re a review on this. And um, thank you everybody for your time. Yeah, if you have any um, uh, questions related to the app itself, feel free to drop us an email at support or support at mytimezero.com and we'll be happy to answer those as well or you know either way digital yachts knows how to get a hold of us if there's a question that's uh, more app related than <clears throat> than hardware size and vice versa so but thank you everybody happy boating hopefully it's sunny where you are i'm in the uk at the moment it's uh five degrees centigrade which is about 40 fahrenheit wet windy 
and uh, not too good. But thank you. Bye for now.